we've come now to the Renaissance. What a great and terrible time to be a poet. The young, handsome, unusually tall Thomas Wyatt learned something of its terribleness after he left the spires of St. John's College, Cambridge, and entered the service of King Henry VIII. Wyatt, as he grew into his, his role as the poet, as a poet, Wyatt wanted to show what the English language could do within the sophisticated decorum of the Petrarchan love tradition. The tradition of love poetry started by the Italian poet Petrarch, which plays with this dynamic of usually a, a young male lover addressing a woman with unrequited love who's either in a high above station than himself um, and, and who will never really look down to him. And so he writes sonnets to her to get her attention. Very popular tradition. Wyatt is often acknowledged to be merely a translator of Italian sonnets, or he has been traditionally, but he actually did much more than that. He adapted the Italian sonnet to the English tongue and introduced the sentiments of Petrarch by rendering it into plain English. I want to show you one of the most beautiful poems, to me, by Thomas Wyatt. Just listen to the the effortless flow of this lover's lament in the delicate lines of this poem. They flee from me that did me sometime, no, excuse me. They flee from me that sometime did me seek with naked foot stalking in my chamber. I have seen them gentle, tame, and meek that now are wild and do not remember that sometime they put themselves in danger to take bread at my hand. And now they range, busily seeking with a continual change. Thank to be fortune, it hath been otherwise twenty times better. But once, in special, in thin array, after a pleasant guise, when her loose gown from her shoulders did fall, and she me caught in her arms long and small, there with all sweetly did me kiss, and softly said, Dear heart, how like you this? It was no dream, I lay broad waking, but all is turned thorough my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking, and I have leave to go of her goodness, and she also, to use newfangledness. But since that I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. Thomas Wyatt's poetry contains this conversational straightforwardness and a, a simplicity that would become the hallmark of at least the discourse of metaphysical poetry usually don't think of metaphysical poetry as being simple, but it's got this direct speech, this direct address. And it also will become characteristic of the devotional style from the Renaissance onward. Perhaps more interesting than Wyatt's refusal to adopt a very ornamental lyrical style is his anti-courtly attitude. You'll notice that this poem is the rhyme royale of Chaucer's Troilus and Crusade, which we encountered at the beginning of our last lecture. Um, and Crusade, very much within this courtly love tradition, Troilus catches a glimpse of Crusade in the temple, and then he's enamored of her. Now, this is very much like Petrarch himself, or at least the speaker of his poems, when he sees Laura in, in church and immediately falls in love with her. Wyatt's strains, though, are tinged with not only the courtly lover's lament and doubt, but a kind of resentment and skepticism towards his past lover that would have been somewhat untoward in Petrarchan uh, love poems. Not totally out of place, but a little untoward. And the poems Wyatt left us temper the courtly romance of the Middle Ages and the Petrarchan love tradition with this anti-courtly attitude. I start with this poem as an example of the shift in poetry and in voice that we get during the Renaissance. 
it's a period you've got psychological self-examination, skepticism and learning, education and political intrigue, piety and sexual desire, religious persecutions and social turmoil. These were all the hallmarks of the English Renaissance. It was a time of new learning with humanism. The invention of the printing press and movable type had happened in the century just prior to the 1500s. There was this revival of the arts. There was war and reformation, devotion and persecution, this soul-burdening theological controversies, a set of controversies, and dilemmas of conscience that affected every rung of the social ladder. But how did this affect the development of English poetry during this time period? That's the question we'll consider in this lecture. Out of this time came one of the most productive periods of English poetry. Renaissance poetry is a, like a cornucopia of new inventions. You've got this relish for the, the refinement of classical art, a new courtly and this anti-courtly attitude. You've got these melodious love lyrics of the Elizabethan age, an exuberant excess of love sonnets around the 1580s and 1590s, and then translations upon translations of psalms into English that are so touching in their English simplicity and their emotional power, and so sobering in their plain, unaffected beauty. Well, welcome all to Lecture 7 in our course, Foundations of English Poetry, sponsored by my Patreon supporters who are gathered with me now and will join me after the lecture for a discussion. The Renaissance typically began in, scholars usually mark it at the beginning of King Henry VIII's reign in 1509 and is considered to go as far as the English wars, the English civil wars in 1641. Okay, 1509, 1641. That's over 100 years. But you should be aware that when you do your own reading and your own research after this, um, that the word Renaissance is contested. You'll often hear more, more, more frequently than not the term early modern period, which is valid. It encompasses the late medieval period, maybe even the 15th century, beginning around Chaucer's death all the way up to the restoration of King Charles II in 1660. So that's even a broader range. But the term Renaissance means rebirth. And as a literary marker, it signifies a moment, I think, of cultural reinvention. And in terms of designating this moment in literary history, I think it's appropriate. And for this lecture, we'll be focusing mostly upon the 16th century, the 1500s. And then in our next lecture, we'll, we'll focus on the early 17th century with the metaphysical poets, the Puritan poets, and the Cavaliers. So during this, during this century, in the 1500s, four major cultural revolutions, uh, or movements rather, took place. The first was, this was the high watermark of the humanist learning. Um, this was the time of the English Reformation. The effects of the printing press were seen during this period. And this was the time of Petrarchan love for the secular lyric lyricists. So let's start with humanism. Humanism was a new kind of literacy and learning that favored Greek sources. Prior scholastic academic thought tended to be mostly Latin ecclesiastical Latin. But with this return to Greek and to some degree the Hebrew, this brought in new modes of thought, new traditions to draw upon. In the latter half of the 1500s in England, this classicism, as it is the beginning of classicism, um, C.S. Lewis in his The Oxford History of English Literature says that the humanist is one who uh, strongly favored Greek and new kinds of Latin. And these humanist principles and critical outlook um, went with these studies, and that this is the first form of classicism. And we're going to see classicism reemerge throughout 
the long narrative arc of the development of English poetry. We're going to see it in our next lecture. We're going to see it during the restor Restoration, and we'll see it in the High Modernist period, too. This is really where it begins. So this classicism, this humanism, infused Christian learning with some of the secular Greek poets, and it was particularly in England, a Protestant kind of Christian learning. Sir Philip Sidney's famous defense of poetry, called the defense of poetry, sometimes called an apology for poetry, demonstrates this unique fusion of classical source, Greek classical sources, with these very Protestant Christian ideas. By poetry, I want to show you uh, an example of uh, an excerpt, rather, for his from his defense of poetry. But before we get there, I just want to say that poetry during this time for Sydney does not mean verse poetry like it means to we uh, post-romantics usually think of the word poetry, we think of verse poetry. For Sir Philip Sidney, it just meant imaginative literature and fiction. So it encompassed all forms of literary fiction and art. And Sidney's defense is one of the cleanest humanist defenses of the value of poetry. It's actually funny what, what got him started on this apology. Uh, it was probably composed in 1581 in response to Stephen Gosson's or Gosson's school of abuse. The school, the school of abuse was a pamphlet that attacked poetry as immoral and dangerous. And Gosson actually dedicated this tract to Sidney, thinking he would approve. Sidney did not approve. His vindication of poetry marshals to the front the great Hebrew, Greek, uh, Latin, and Christian poets for the defense of poetry. And for all of these poets, Sidney says, for the Hebrews, for the Greeks, for the Latins, even to some extent for some of the English poets that he deals with, the poet was like a prophet. I find this so interesting. Let me pull up this quotation from Sir Philip Sidney. Let's do the slideshow. He writes, but since the authors of most of our sciences were the Romans, and before them the Greeks, let us a little stand upon their authorities. Ah, now here's the humanist dimension, the argumentation of drawing in the authority here from Greeks and Latins, but even so far as to see what names they have given unto this now scorned skill. Among the Romans, a poet was called Vates, which is as much as a diviner, foreseer, or prophet, as by his conjoined words, Vaticinium and Vaticinari is manifest. So heavenly a title did that excellent people bestow upon this heart-ravishing knowledge. Uh, isn't that just a wonderful term for poetry, by the way? Heart-ravishing knowledge. In Greek, Sidney goes on and says that the Greeks deemed the poet a maker, um, a creator. Um, and uh, also upon this idea, let me admit David here. He draws upon this idea to show this isn't just a Roman thing. This is also a Greek thing. So the attack on poetry came not just from the humanists and not just from the Christians. It's often couched as, oh, well, he was, a, he was responding, Sir Philip Sidney was responding to the dismissal of poetry by the Puritans. Many Puritans were supporters of poetry. Some of them were not. It's true. And some of the humanists were also skeptical of poetry. So here he's talking to the humanists when he's drawing on the Greeks and the Latins. And now he's directing the church's, he's addressing the church's suspicion of humanism. When he says, and may not I presume a little further and say that the holy David's psalms are a divine poem? If I do, I shall not do it without the testimony of great learned men, both ancient and modern. But even the name of psalms will speak for me, which being interpreted as nothing but songs. But truly, now having named him, David, I fear I seem to profane that holy name, applying it to poetry, which 
is among us thrown down to so ridiculous an estimation. But they that with quiet judgments will look a little deeper into it, but they that with these quiet judgments shall find the end and working of it, such as being rightly applied, deserves not to be scourged out of the church of God. So he's laying it out for both the humanists and the church critics who are suspicious of poetry. And notice, too, the testimony of great uh, men, both ancient and modern, relying with this authorial weight with this humanist uh, approach to this tradition. Sidney's humanistic learning argues the moral and social benefits of poetry. He goes on, it's an excellent essay. He says that poetry offers representations of the ideal, what should be, which inspire us to virtue. It's superior to other forms of documentary knowledge such as history, he says, because it foregrounds universal truths against particular facts and details. Poetry, he says, engages the imagination and enables the shaping of social and individual realities. And it connects us to the past in interesting ways and tempts us to improve the present. So at the time, during the continued Reformation, when nearly everything was a candidate for expulsion by the Protestants, uh, Sidney rescued poetry from both classical and religious repudiation. Now let's turn a little bit, let's turn our attention to the Reformation. The Reformation under King Henry VIII, under his son Edward VI, under Queen Elizabeth I, involved, among other things, this departure from the Roman papacy, the translation of the Bible into English, and the introduction of church services being uh, spoken in English. So the liturgy was now English, thanks to the 1840s Book of Common Prayer. But accompanying all these changes, there was a revived interest in the Psalms. The English poet John Lyly, who was writing at this time, he died in 1606, in what's often considered the first novel, his Euphies, says that the English think it a great mirth to sing psalms in the same way that the Europeans like to chant sonnets. They say that the English folks were just obsessed with psalms, much the same way there was a sonnet craze uh, on the continent. The publication of Sternhold and Hopkins' book, of English psalms, authorized by Queen Elizabeth I, adapted the Hebrew poems to English ballad meter. This was interesting. It was, it, it, we're, we're lost, it's, it would be like, it's hard for us to, sit, to get a sense of how irreverent and radical that was. It's almost like if we were to translate the psalms and adapt them to like Disney movie, songs, musicals, or, or Taylor Swift, popular, her, her popular songs, something that everyone knows that isn't associated with religion at all. Ballads were sometimes bawdy, um, often involving mur murder, uh, but they were adapted to these melodies, and it had this democratizing effect upon the culture. These poems were simple and appropriately artless. Other translators experimented with forms of style, and here is an example of that. Sternhold and Hopkins, down there at the bottom left, this is the first verse from Psalm 23. What's interesting about the Sternhold and Hopkins, ignore the Sydney Psalter for a moment. The interesting thing about Sternhold and Hopkins is that they don't like fancy language including metaphors, so that if sometimes they find a metaphor in the Hebrew, they'll be at pains to translate it as literally as possible. And here's this, I believe this is William Keith's translation. There are a number of contributors to the Sternhold and Hopkins Psalter. The Lord is only my support, and he that doth me feed. How can I then lack anything whereof I stand in need? Again, kind of artless, almost needlessly artless. You, they could have 
made it sing a little better and they could have preserved the metaphor that is so artfully preserved in Sir Philip Sidney's translation in the Sidney Psalter. The Lord, the Lord, my shepherd is. There's the metaphor from the Hebrew. And so can never I taste misery. He rests me in green pastures his by waters still and sweet. He guides my feet. Sidney and his sister, uh, Lady Mary Sidney Herbert, wanted to beautify the translations of the Psalms. Here, by the way, for your comparison, is the uh, Miles Coverdale translation that was included uh, to be read during the liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. He shall feed me in a green pasture and lead me forth beside the waters of comfort. And it, it's, it's, these are usually sung or chanted, I believe, at this time, uh, as they still are in, in, in some Anglican services, I believe. But notice how he translates still waters into waters of comfort, doing the interpretive work from still to comfort. So again, stylistically different from the bare plain style of Sternhold and Hopkins. Um, in, in terms of typography, it's shaped differently from these lyrical visual experimentations of the Sydney Psalter. And then, of course, we have the 1611 King James Version that is well known. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Uh, and this was just translated artfully, but as literally as possible, uh, I believe, in, according to the preface there. But this gives you a good example of the competing styles. They were wrestling with questions. How do we represent devotional poetry? What's the best way to do it? Um, what's the most reverent way? Should we make it beautiful? Should we make it plain? Um, all of this was, was part of the turmoil of the translators, and they just relished um, exploring that dilemma. Let me talk briefly about the printing revolution and how that affected poetry, because it, it, certainly, it certainly did in ways that I think often go unnoticed. The printing revolution began in Germany around 1440, when the goldsmith uh, Johannes Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press. What this means is that uh, no longer are the scribes writing it. No longer is it necessarily decorated by hand or written by hand, but you can make mass produ productions of Bibles and books, and it fits on the page a certain way. This meant that verse took on a visual aspect, whereas before, you remember Chaucer standing up behind his podium, reading to the audience from our last lecture, very oral art. Now it's starting to take on this visual dimension. So you have this wonderful blending of the visual and sonic experiences. Let me give you an example of this. One of this would be, of course, uh, George Herbert's devotional poetry. Here we have his The Altar. He wasn't the only one doing this. You see, this is a sonnet. It's 14 lines made in the shape of an altar. Uh, and we have also, this is how it would have looked typographically, the Easter Wings poem. In fact, I believe in the original printing, you actually had to turn the book on the side to get the readings. But there they are. Let me give you an example of how this affected the experience. The new critics, the American new critics, whom you know I like, but with some qualification, the new critics introduced this way in the 20th century, the new critics, the close readers, this new way of reading a poetry as a poem as a visual icon. And that's partly why the metaphysical poets of this time period became the darlings of the new critical movement, because it lended very well to their critical approach. Um, a, a visual icon, you see it, the first thing that greets you from the page is the sight of the ink and the type arranged within the blank space. 
But Herbert doesn't just make it spatial. He makes it also audible. And so you notice it starts out with pentameter uh, and then works its way down to manometer. Lord, who createst man in wealth and store, though foolishly he lost the same, decaying more and more till he became most poor. Notice how as the content is talking about the impoverishment of man, it's the, the lines are contracting. We've got this metrical con contraction. And then this turn with metrical expansion. So first with man and then with thee. And here's the symmetrical turn with thee. Oh, let me rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day thy victories. Then shall the fall further the flight in me. Arriving back in these swinging iams, it's, it's more like the beat of wings here, this consonance of the F, further the flight in me. The same thing goes on visually. You know, there's a, there's a certain dimension of this poem that is lost if you only hear it. And there's a certain dimension of this poem that's lost if you only see it. My tender age in sorrow did begin, and still with sickness and shame, thou didst so punish sin that I became most thin. Notice the metrical contraction, and then the same turn happening again. With thee, let me combine and feel thy victory. For if I imp my wing on thine, affliction shall advance the flight in me. And then this expansion here as it turns up. Notice the, the negotiation between looking at the self, self-examination, which is usually negative, and then looking to God, which allows for the expansion and eventually ending in flight. Imp, by the way, was an agricultural metaphor um, for grafting, but it also was used in falconry, um, a, a favorite sport among the, the gentry at this time. If a falcon damaged or lost some of its feathers, you could actually imp or graft fake feathers on top of it, allowing the bird to fly until the, the, the feathers grow back. One more thing about the visual presence of the poem on the page. I can't talk about the Renaissance with at least, without at least mentioning uh, Edmund Spencer. And I have that on the slide. I just want to show you the first uh, canto. First stanza of the first canto. Spencer, Edmund Spencer, wrote a collection of narrative poems, often considered an epic, called The Fairy Queen. Um, this was one of the most popular, well-loved poems up until like the first decade of the 20th century, when it started to, critics and scholars started to turn away from it. But this was a staple. This often was what converted people into lovers of poetry, this poem beautiful romance, uh, after the chivalric style. The stanza, each one of these poems, uh, the whole story is revealed in these stanzas, which make up little, as it were, bite-sized pictures on the page, clusters. And so here's the first one, stanzas composed of nine iambic lines, uh, or actually eight iambic lines, no, they're, they're all iambic lines, but the first eight are iambic pentameter, and the final line is iambic hexameter. We've got the rhyme scheme to the right. It's a beautiful little form, remarkably suited for Spencer's style of storytelling. It allows for ample room for luxurious digression and vivid description. It also allows for quick movement and action during some of the battle scenes. It can be enchanting and magical analytical. It can be imaginative and abstract and philosophical, mystical and realistic, emotive, intellectual. It can do so many things. And let's just first read this stanza, get a sense of how it works. A gentle knight was pricking on the plain, he clad in mighty arms and silver shield. 
wherein old dints of deep wounds did remain, the cruel marks of many a bloody field. Yet arms till that time did he never wield. His angry steed did chide his foaming bit, as much disdaining to the curb to yield. Full jolly knight he seemed, and fair did sit, as one for knightly jousts and fierce encounters fit. An important moment in the description when we're introduced to the main character of Book One, the Red Cross Knight. Notice the first five lines, how they're bound, set apart, not only by a period, but also by the rhyme scheme, tied off with a couplet, giving the sense of conclusion, field and wield. And then it allows for this turn, sometimes if the poet wills, to a new tone or a new idea. You notice the shift happens right there after the couplet, turning from the knight to his ang angry steed. And then the stanza rounds off to a close with a summary returning to the knight. Um, and that rhyming couplet, it's CC, gives it that finality, but also that extra foot of the last line, that hexameter, gives the final st stanza, it gives the final line of the stanza, this sense of closure with its metric weight. So you've, you've made it this far in the lecture, then you've already begun reading The Fairy Queen. So you might as well um, finish book one, as I hope you'll continue. But this is, this is how the printing revol revolution changed poetry from primarily an oral art to one that is to be experienced in the privacy of silent reading, of an encounter between the reader and a book. That's something that's that's new and interesting, something we take for granted. So I wanted to point that out. Finally, we have to talk about the Petrarchan love and the sonnet craze. Sir Thomas Wyatt, we're going to circle back to him here at the end. He's credited for introducing the Italian form into English through his translations of Petrarch. These sonnets uh, infected poets like a fever until in the 1580s and 90s, almost every poet had caught the craze, including Spencer. He has beautiful sonnets in his sequence called the Amoretti Sonnets. Um, each poet, because they were so popular, each poet had to put a fresh spin on the sonnets. And so something fun to do if you have a spare week is to read Michael Drayton's Ideas Mirror with Shakespeare's sonnets and Sir Philip Sidney's Astrophil and Stella and Spencer's Amoretti and, and draw connections and think, okay, what are they trying to do differently? Because they're, it's old hat at this point in the 1590s. So they have to do something new to get readers' attention. Each poet puts this fresh spin. One of the ways they did that was by not taking themselves too seriously. And this was Sir Philip Sidney's mode. Um, as his... Uh, he often made fun of the conventions of the sonnet sequence. He has a sonnet sequence called Astrophil and Stella. The first sonnet begins with a really great description of writer's block, which I'm going to put up here. Here we go. Uh, and this is the very first sonnet. Now, P the Petrarchan love lyric was supposed to get the attention a lover who is far beyond reach, on a pedestal, so idealized, uh, and to get her attention, and where love was impossible, at least gain her pain and grief uh, for having having these strains of woe, um, and that's 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 what the sonnet convention tries to do. So this is what this speaker in Stella's in Stella in the Stella sequence sonnet one does. Loving in truth, and fain in verse my love to show, that she, dear she, might take some pleasure of my pain. Pleasure might cause her read, reading might make her know. Knowledge might pity win, and pity grace obtain. I sought fit words to paint the blackest face of woe, studying inventions fine her wits to entertain, of turning others' leaves to see if thence would flow some fresh and fruitful showers upon my 
sunburned brain, but words came halting forth, wanting invention's stay. Invention, nature's child, fled, stepdame, studies blows. The other's feet still seemed but strangers in my way. Thus, great with child to speak, and helpless in my throes, biting my truant pin, beating myself for spite. Fool, said my muse to me, look in thy heart and write. And this is how the sight sequence begins. Notice the Petrarchan modes here, loving and truth. Uh, so he truly loves, he's not feigning, and happily would in verse show her my love so that she might take pleasure uh, in my love sickness, in my pain. And then he has this clumsy unfolding of the train of thought. Is this supposed to be a bad sonnet? Um, pain, yeah, pleasure from my pain. Pleasure might cause her read. Reading might make her know. No, knowledge might pity win and pity grace obtain. He's getting excited and thinking about what these sonnets are going to do. Okay, they're going to, to get her attention. So then he goes to the desk and begins to write. He sought fit words to paint his sorrow. He studied other people's sonnets, other people's poems, read the Petrarch poems, hoping that from others' leaves or from others' pages, he would get inspired. Notice this strange metaphor, some fresh and fruitful showers upon my sunburned brain. I mean, we're, we're starting to see how the metaphysical poets and their strange imagery is actually rooted in this Elizabethan lyric mode. Uh, and, and it's there. It doesn't come out of nowhere. But words come halting forth. He can't think of things to, to say. Um, studying is, is beating nature's child, invention, inspiration. It's this tortured thing. And then you've got this really, I think, out of place metaphor. Thus great with child, as though he were pregnant, trying to speak, but it, he's helpless in his throes. The work of art's not being delivered. He's biting his truant pin. Now he's blaming the pin. Um, hitting himself, beating himself with spite. And then finally, the muse, out of either pity or exasperation, comes down and saves the day with his deus ex machina advice. Fool, look in thy heart and write. It's actually pretty funny, and you can see how this is deliberately is deliberately complex uh, with its and poor with its halting meter and with its overlengthened lines of hexameter. This is not the iambic pentameter sonnet. This is the iambic hexameter with six feet. Uh, it's bloated, but it grabs the attention of the reader by telling them, "Ah, here's something new and fresh," and that was the challenge of the sonneteers, and something to keep in mind when you're reading them. All right. This lecture has only skimmed the surface of the rich uh, and complex world of English Renaissance poetry during the 16th century. We're going to be coming back to many of these ideas in the future lectures. Our next lecture will cover the early 17th century and will highlight three important styles uh, that, that are indebted to the Renaissance poetry we read tonight. You've got the metaphysical style, the Puritan style, and the cavalier style. It might be called the cavalier tradition. And now we're going to move into a compare and contrast uh, for our discussion. This is what we'll be uh, contrasting. Michael Drayton's Sonnet 61 from Idea, his sonnet sequence, and Shakespeare's Sonnet 33. So for those on YouTube, just watching the video, um, feel free to join in in the chat with this comparison, thinking about the structure and how sense unfolds in each in different ways. So anyway, thanks for watching everyone on YouTube and until next time.